Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox. For my co-host, Randy Ford, I want to welcome you to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. My guest today is an accomplished business owner with firsthand understanding of the dynamics and stresses of the workplace, the challenges of management and supervision, and the pressures and demands of business partnerships. For nine years, he was the first director of the master's degree program in conflict and dispute resolution at the University of Oregon, teaching and mentoring students and building the program to a position of national prominence. He is the owner and principal of Connexus Conflict Management, providing mediation, facilitation, and conflict resolution and communication assistance to individuals, families, and organizations. And if that wasn't enough, he is the author of Embodied Conflict, The Neural Basis of Conflict and Communication, which was published in 2018. Tim Hicks, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Hey, thank you, Howard. Really great to be here with you. Tim, I have to say I'm a little intimidated. This is a a topic that's near and dear to my heart, the idea of conflict, the neuroscience of conflict, and now I have an expert yeah. <laughs> I'm talking to. And so <laughs> I'm going to count to 10, get past that intimidation, <laughs> but I am so excited to, to have you on the podcast today. And I'd love to learn about the book, but first let's give our uh, listening audience a little context of your background and how you got into this world of mediation and you know, what prompted you to want to write this book? Yeah. Well, I got into the field way back in the early 90s through my interest in environmental issues and uh, researching and thinking about, you know, what we were doing with the environment at the time. I came across this field called environmental dispute resolution and knew nothing about it. In fact, the term dispute resolution was a bit mystifying to me at the time. <laughs> but the more I investigated it, the more I realized that it was an area that I really want to work in. It For whatever reasons, the idea of helping people bridge the divides between them was very appealing to me. And so I began to study, read, went to many conferences, took a number of trainings, et cetera, et cetera, and then finally opened to practice. Now, so you're, one of your first businesses, did it deal specifically with the area of environmental dispute resolution? Uh, well, no. Our first business, my wife and I started a business that grew from zero to about 150 employees in seven years between 1983 and 1990. And that was a mail order business, a retail, had six retail stores. That business gave me the experience in the corporate environment that really benefited me later when I got into my conflict resolution work because I could work with management, senior management, CEOs, business owners with a familiarity for what they're facing. Yeah. Sure. You know, it's interesting that just that that business itself is like a education by fire in a way because oh, yeah. you've got different uh, kinds of employees. Some are educated, some are not. There's social economic challenges. And, you know, just different types of styles of communication. So I yeah. imagine you learned a lot there. I did learn a lot, yeah. And so with this interest in environmental dis dispute resolution, how did that kind of evolve into the future work then? Yeah. Well, at one point, I realized if I want to make a living in this conflict resolution field, one avenue in was divorce mediation, because I figured a lot of people were getting divorced. And maybe, they still are, by the way. They still are, yeah. And I still do divorce mediation, although it's a, a smaller part of my work. But yeah, so I thought that might be the way in. And so I opened up a divorce mediation practice. And actually, at the time, uh, back in the early 90s, after my experience uh, with building that, growing that business, I thought, I don't really want to work in the corporate environment. I'd kind of bit a burnt out um, from that whole experience. But then I realized uh, after I got into practice that a lot of people were coming to me because of my experience with that prior business. And so I started to work in organizational settings as well. And, and that became a, a bigger part of my work. And then, you know, over the years, I was always 
interested in the theoretical aspects and the kind of philosophical and social psychological dimensions to this field of conflict resolution, which is inherently interdisciplinary, as we as we put it. It really, you know, conflict resolution is, although we're often focusing on, you know, particular issues, particular disputes, trying to get a settlement for, you know, an insurance dispute over money or a real estate dispute or whatever. But in fact, conflict resolution has to do with everything it means to be human being in relationship with other human beings. And so that dimension of the field is has always been a kind of primary interest to me. And so then I began to teach more. I was really interested in what kind of educational background is helpful for somebody working in this field. And then that ended up with me between the years of 2006 to the end of 2014, being the first director of the graduate program in conflict resolution at the University of Oregon, where I had a chance to build a program and to spend two years with students exploring the various dimensions and, and uh, yeah, aspects of, of this, of this multidimensional field. Yeah, I'm curious. You had mentioned the, the types of disciplines, professions that would fit. Yeah, would so relate. To, yeah. yeah, within the, the conflict and dispute resolution field, what, what did you find there? What, what, are there certain types of professions that lend themselves more versus others? Well, in terms of disciplines, psychology, obviously, is the most obvious one, and particularly what's called social psychology. And what really opened my eyes at one point was I began to read in social psychology an area that has to do with what's called um, social identity theory, which is basically the work that's been done on understanding in-group, out-group behavior and how we very naturally and almost unavoidably associate with and identify with certain in-groups. And then there are behaviors that are consistent and predictable in terms of positive affiliation and positive uh, identification with one's own in-group and a kind of enmification of the other group. And so, you know, one of the exercises I do with groups I'm working with is I'll ask them, you know, how many of you are lookers and how many of you are leapers? How many of you like to think about things before you make a decision? And how many like to, you know, make a decision right off the bat? And usually, typically, I've done this with many groups, anywhere between one third to two thirds to 50 50, it splits always. And then I ask the two groups to divide into uh, a separate group uh, in the room, and I ask them to answer three questions. One is, what words would you use to describe your own group? What words would you use to describe the other group? And what words do you think they would use to describe you? And consistently, we have positive words for, to our own group, negative words to the other group, and we expect that they would characterize us negatively. We see this with, you know, when you go to a university as a student, you immediately identify with you know, at the University of Oregon, it's the, it's the ducks. Just down the road is the Oregon State University and the beavers, you know, and people get very attached to these in-groups and out-groups. So that, that really helped me, actually, when I went in to work with organizations and was brought in to deal with a conflict between, uh, let's say, the, the manager of the warehouse and the manager of the front office, or the conflict between uh, sales and marketing, realizing that part of the dimension of the conflict was this in-group, out-group affiliation thing. So it's just an example of how the insights of various disciplines can inform our own understanding of conflict and conflict behavior. Interesting. You know, when I started coaching and I, I went back to school 2008, so we're going on about 11 years now. And some areas that really resonated for me was this topic of emotional intelligence. You know, there's, and the, we perceive a threat and we get anxious and we do something about it and that can lead into conflict and yeah. how we deal with it. Um, the, some work that I do uh, is on the behavioral side of conflict, very much like the, the example you just, shared about the in-group and out-group, what are the words we use to describe us. And uh, the model that I use is, is the DISC model of product. It's called productive conflict, everything DISC, productive conflict. 
there's other conflict style instruments that are behavioral based and yes and then the uh judith glazer may she rest in peace just passed away recently wrote a book on conversational intelligence which started to enter into the domain of what the conversation we want to get into is which is the neural basis how we move from a conversations to talk and put our point out there versus conversations where we're listening to understand. And if, if we don't do that, we kind of ratchet up the angst in the conversation. And, yeah. and then there's the, those, those conflict, um, the conversational books, you know, productive conflict, fear, productive conversations, fierce conversations, crucial conversations, difficult conversations. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. which all those books kind of, I thought it was interesting. Here's a model, but the model didn't take into account how you handle conversation behaviorally, how you handle conversations as well. And it was almost like, well, you should follow this model. And some people, depending like on the in-group and out-group, depending on the words, you're all in a certain way to how to handle a conversation. Mm. And so I'm really interested then is, so there's this interest in the, you know, the, the social identity, social psychology, this, the behavior, in-group, out-group behavior. How did that start to coalesce into the work that you're doing today? And, and I don't necessarily mean to put you on the spot. It's not the purpose of this podcast. Yeah. It's insight. And, but how does this, I don't want to say stack up because I'm not one versus the other, but how does it compare to some of the bodies of work that are there and how is your work and in, 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 in the text embodied conflict moving the conversation forward? Cause I just think it's completely fascinating and I yeah. want to learn more. Yeah. I mean, a number of people to my prize and pleasure have called the book groundbreaking. And I think the reason they've said that is that it has, kind of opened a window, a way of looking at what's actually happening between us and why is it happening that way? Why does, why does disagreement feel like it does for us? And why is it so hard to listen to somebody with whom we disagree? What is the whole subject of agreement and disagreement about? Or why is it that uh, we so strongly want to be right about things. And then we get into battles about, you know, who's right and who's wrong. And even little kids in the sandbox will, you know, will be fighting, tis not, tis so, tis not, tis so. So the book cr creates an explanatory framework for understanding these experiences and these behaviors and why our differences are so difficult for us, whether they're diff racial differences, ethnic differences, ideological differences, political differences, or just disagreements about particular, you know, what's right, what's true, what's good. So yeah, so the book, um, and, and the way that I got there was through just my reading in, in neuroscience in part, but it actually the seeds of it were I woke up one, one night in the middle of the night with this realization and I got up and kind of wrote it down and it was the seeds of a, an article that I wrote back in uh, 2000, I think it was, which was the beginning of uh, what then became the book. Um, but I woke up realizing or interested in the connection between on the one hand, our, what I call our reality construction needs and our identity formation needs. Uh, in other words, we have to, create an understanding of what is real in the world in order to navigate the world and our identity formation, which is a developmental process that happens from birth, the connection between those two things and our conflict experience in relationship. Uh, and that's where it all started. So the book, as it's constructed, how do you, is it kind of, uh, well, actually, if you can then, yeah. just to share a little bit about how the book is laid out. I mean, and I'm also curious, who are the readers of yeah. this book? I mean, it, somebody like me who's just fascinated by the topic, is it, the la is it somebody who just comes across it in the bookstore? Or is this an, acad is this an academic book? It's, you know, it falls somewhere in the middle. It's not really academic it's accessible to anybody who reads 
and anybody who's interested in human behavior. It's uh, useful, I think, to anybody because we're all involved in relationship. And so it sheds light on our on what's happening in communication, what's happening in relationship. You know, it would be definitely very worthwhile for parents to read it because their relationship with their children and how they communicate with their children is, is addressed in the book. And, and um, it, th but that said, it was largely targeted to begin with at the conflict resolution world, at, at the practitioners, the mediators, the trainers, the, um, the professors in various uh, academic disciplines. So it kind of straddles those two worlds. I would like to write a book that takes the same content and makes it more widely available for the general market. And that's kind of on my to-do list. But, but the book is definitely very readable to, to anybody who's interested. And, and I, think we'll, I think anybody who read it would find direct application to their own life. And I've given presentations to, I just got back in June from a six city tour in Europe that had been set up for me by somebody who had been very impressed by the book. And I had all kinds of people in the audience in these six cities, and they all found it very, very interesting and stimulating. Either you have another question, or I can go on and talk a little bit about the layout of the book, or, or do you... Oh, please, you know, please do. I, I was just dawning on me, and the mentioning the, the world tour, I'm involved in an organization, uh, it's called WBECS, W-B-E-C-S, World Business Executive Coaching Symposium, but it's a worldwide community of coaches and I was just thinking, and this topic would be a perfect addition to that organization. So that's yeah. one I'd definitely love to make an introduction to Great. you. Great. Yeah, I love to talk to groups about, about this work. Um, the way the book's laid out is uh, there's a, a preface that kind of sets the stage and an introduction also that sets the stage. And then um, there's a section kind of of some basic background truths of our of our lives as human beings bear the some of those aspects in terms of our survival needs our you know the fact that there are physical survival needs but also psychological and social survival needs that we have things like that but then the the next chapter presents the neural encoding function that's the core of the book that we have this capacity the brain to encode in neural structures our perceptual experience. Otherwise, we wouldn't have learning, we wouldn't have memory, and indeed we wouldn't be able to think, we wouldn't have any cognitive capacities, and we wouldn't have any identity. And this neural, so it describes the neural encoding function, which is in, in layman's terms, because neuroscience at this point really doesn't understand how it all works. But we do know that uh, when I have an experience on a particular day, the next day I can remember it. How is that so? It's because somehow the brain has, has taken in those uh, stimuli and we only have five senses and we have been formed, our brains, our neural structures have been formed in response to those experiences and we remember them. And we speak about children having formative experiences. They're actually formative on, on the physical level. And when we talk about changing somebody's mind, if we're in a discussion and I'm trying to change your mind about something, what you believe in, I'm speaking actually literally, not just figuratively. I'm trying to change your, the physical structure of your body in these neural networks. And so that function is described. And then the next chapter goes into some of the main characteristics of the neural encoding function. For example, there's a balance between plasticity and stability. On the one hand, those structures we want to endure. We want to be able to depend on what we have already learned. But on the other hand, we need also to be flexible enough to change those structures if information suggests that we have to revise our understanding. But there can be a resistance to that change, as we all know when we get into conflict. Yeah. So I talk about seven different characteristics of the, of the neural encoding function. And then the next section goes into the implications for communication and relationship. So for example, when we realize that, that my words enter into you, 
they carry across from my body to your body without any meaning attached. They're just sounds, but they activate in you the neural structures that have been established by your past experience in association with those word sounds. Now, hopefully, the associations you have to those word sounds are similar enough to the associations I have that there's understanding. But it's very easy for there to be misunderstanding based on, you know, that we have different associations. But also, another implication is recognizing that our words actually enter into the body of the other person and either threaten to or request that that person change, changes their body, changes their mind, yeah? And so it's much, the communication experience is much more intimate than we often think about it. And in conflict situations or in situations where there's a power differential, like between parents and children, there's a huge vulnerability. My words can actually hurt you or can influence you. So, you know, things like propaganda and brainwashing demonstrate how powerful words can be. And therefore, there's a responsibility in our communication when we realize that we're actually working with people's bodies. And if parents realize that, then they might be much more careful about how they speak with their children and what messages they give to them, realizing the impact on their children's bodies that can uh, last for, you know, decades. So that's just some examples of the, some of the implications that the, both the encoding function and the characteristics of the encoding function have for communication and relationship. And then there's a section on this specifically directed at conflict resolution practitioners, mediators, facilitators on how this understanding might affect their practice. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting is I am confident that I cannot have been the first person to ever ask you this question, but there's so much angst around this world today in yes. our government the environment it's it's interesting you talked about your your initial interest in the environmental dispute resolution the topic of global warming is it really affecting us and yeah. you know, i have a, an author coming on in a couple of weeks who's basically disputing there really isn't a problem <laughs> okay fine mm -hmm. but how do we you know and we only have five minutes left so how do we in the spirit of moving the conversation forward, invite people to want to learn more and how can this work help them at least look at the words coming across and entering the, each other's body, the yeah. ones that I'm going to consider as opposed to putting up a barrier and saying you're wrong and yeah. you're bad. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the big question. How do we change how people deal with our disagreements and differences in a more collaborative, cooperative way, less violent? How do we become, be willing to become less certain of our own perspectives and more open to other perspectives? And how do we live together uh, when we have disagreements and differences? Uh, that's, the, that's the question of the ages. I think that there's no doubt that education, information can help, that the more, you know, when I got into the conflict resolution field, I was very bad at dealing with conflict. And about two years into it, uh, my older daughter, at the time she was about 10 years old, and she came up to me one day and she said, you know, Pops, I'm really glad you got into this conflict resolution stuff because you're a much better dad now. <laughs> wow, 10 yeah. years old. Yeah, and it was true. You know, the things that I had learned in my mediation trainings and my conflict resolution trainings and the readings that I'd done changed how I understood myself and how I understood relationship and how I saw my responsibilities in relationships. So education is a big part. And I think that's why I want to write another book in more geared towards the general public, because somehow we have to begin to realize how we function as people and our responsibility in relationship to somehow be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. We're also willing to be part of the problem. You know, I, I would have to say, you really need to put your head down and finish writing that book because, I mean, so forget the fact there's social media out there, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera. 
this the conversation is all vitriolic. I mean, it's just yeah. nothing nice anymore. We all, it's always my way versus your way, and yeah. it it doesn't bode well for uh, humanity. And no. uh, somehow we've got to learn to bridge this impasse. And yeah. one, of, one of the things that I say to to my clients in the corporate organizational world is, you know, we're not trying to be right. We're trying to find right together. And that's a cooperative process. And it means a little bit of humility and less arrogance and less need to win. But the book uh, that we've been talking about uh, explains a little bit why we so tend to want to be right and to win. Uh, and there, and therefore, you know, understanding that reality of us as a human organism, as a living organism, then may help us to be able to manage it a little bit better. Interesting. You know, in our podcast, we have a piece at the end, which we call an insight to go. And as you just shared that piece, I was thinking that's the insight to go. Uh, you know, yeah. we, we have, we need to find a way to have a little less arrogance, a little less need to win and be open to listening to understand. Yeah. Tim, if our listeners want to learn more about you and your work now, we are going to provide links back to the book on Amazon, but if there are other places that they can reach out to you, learn more about you, the whole topic around dispute resolution and mediation, what's the best place for them to go to? Sure, they should go to my website, which is now under reconstruction, redesign, but they'll still get there. It's just changing right now, but it's Tim at... Well, the website is connexusconflictmanagement.com. Yeah, let's That's C C oh. yeah C O N N E X U S conflict management all one word dot com. Well, we'll provide that link as well in the show notes. I, I had a lesson learned from someone else. I am no longer providing email addresses because uh -huh. okay. uh, last thing you want is thousands of people emailing you. Maybe you do. Well, they can email me from the website, but yeah. That's perfect. Let them go to the website. Yep. You know, in the, just like another minute, if we can, just to draw us to close, what's the ultimate, when you look back at your life's work, I mean, and you've got many, many years to go, but when you look back, what, what do you want folks to say about you and the work that you've done in this space and how, you know, how you're making that difference? Wow. Well, if, you know, if, if I thought about how that I'd want them to describe me uh, on, as, I, as I lay there in, in dust and ashes, um, uh, you know, I, I think they'd probably say, and I'd probably agree, that uh, I was a very inquisitive guy <laughs> and cared a lot about, um, you know, how we engage with each other. And, and uh, that some, for some reason... I'm one of those people, and there are many of us who have this call to want to be somehow peacemakers, however you understand that word. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of the thread and the theme of, of my work. Fantastic. Tim, hang on for just a minute. Get ready to sign off. I want to thank you again for taking time out of your day to spend with us and on Success Insight Podcast, talk about you, your, your background, your, and the, your body of work, and especially, you know, this new book, Embodied Conflict, The Neural Basis of Conflict and Communications, which was uh, recently published. So thank you again for spending time with us. Hey, Howard, thank you. It's been really a pleasure. Excellent. Hang on just a minute, okay? All right, folks, there you have it. You know, these conversations go by pretty quickly. And this is one that was near and dear to my heart. And this is an area I've always been interested in. So I really appreciate Tim's spending time with us today. I hope you appreciate the conversation. Definitely go out to the website. We'll put the link in our show notes. And we'll have also the link to the book on Amazon. So for my co-host, Randy Ford, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there and have a phenomenal day and listen to understand. And it's not about winning. It's about understanding and creating conversation. Have a great day, everybody. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. 
Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.